Well, obviously, I'm a break dancer. Which, of course, is the first thing you'd think about when you see a tall, awkward, white priest. <laughs> You're thinking, this guy must love to dance. Because white people are known for their dancing. It's pretty much what we do best. We've created various styles of dancing. We have river dance, <laughs> square dancing, we even have polka. And priests, they've been sidestepping things for years. In fact, a well-trained priest can sidestep pretty much any difficult question. I know. And beyond dancing around issues, religion and dance actually have a lot of things in common. And that pretty much every culture has dance and religion as part of their heritage. They're essentially two very different languages, but tackling a very similar problem. See, dance and religion both tackle the questions of the meaning of life and the importance of human connection in their own way. That's right, dance is actually a language. The rhythm, it's grammatical structure, and the movement, it's meaning. And when you really start to study the dance of different cultures, you see that there's a lot of traditions and values and history that is encoded in these dances. Now, like with most languages, my origin of the language of dance started with my parents. They were both dancers at the University of Michigan. My dad actually taught Madonna how to dance. No, don't be excited about that. She's not very good. <laughs> In fact, I talked to the uh, head of the program about Madonna, and she's one of these artsy women that like, doesn't care about pop culture. And she goes, oh, yeah, I remember that one of our students got famous, Madonna. That's who she's talking about? And she says, I remember her. Uh, I watched a music video of her recently to see how she developed as an artistic talent because she was beautiful but not a very good dancer. And I said, well, what did you think? And she said, well, she's still beautiful. <laughs> my dad, she felt differently about. In fact, my dad had a poster for 30 years at the University of Michigan Dance Department, just him, across the stage. And he actually was invited to Alvin Ailey's dance company, which is a big deal. He could have been a professional dancer, but instead he focused on raising a family. So it should come as no surprise that he gave birth, well, my mom did most of the labor, but he gave birth to three beautifully talented, amazing dancing boys. Problem is he had four kids. I was the fourth child and I did not get the dancing gene. I look like an ostrich that's having a seizure when I tried to dance. I had no coordination, no natural ability, no awareness of where my body was, and worst of all, no rhythm. One time, in attempting a clap, someone asked me what I was trying to hit. I looked like I was trying to swat a fly. Now, the answer was the beat. I just can never find it. I have to watch to this very day people clap just to try to stay in rhythm. But dancing is a visual art, so I'll just show you what I used to dance like. Because when I first learned to dance, I danced like this. <laughs> now, I did that for a couple reasons. One, it's always fun to watch a priest make a fool of himself. Two, we have this problem with the language of dance, in that we have a myth out there that there are some people that are dancers and other people that are not. And whether you're Elaine from Seinfeld, Carlton from Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, or just an un uncoordinated white guy, when you dance in a way that other people see as unesthetically pleasing, they tell you, stop that, stop that now. And they say that you must not be a dancer. Now, if we think of dance like a language, what would you think of someone that told a child that was struggling to speak English that maybe they just shouldn't talk, maybe they're just not a speaker, 
maybe they should just be quiet forever. You wouldn't do that. And in the same way, you shouldn't tell people that they should dance or shouldn't dance based on whether they're aesthetically pleasing to the eye. When you look at the benefits of dancing, physically, we increase our cardiovascular system, we are healthy and lose weight, and we have all of this positive endorphins that emotionally helps us to fight off depression and anxiety, and intellectually, we have different areas of our brain that fire and help build the neuron connections. And you're going to tell me that certain people shouldn't dance? It helps fight off dementia. They use it in treatment for Parkinson's. The benefits of dance are a human thing. It's not about affinity or style or pleasing. It's just about dancing because you love to dance. And if you're struggling to dance and, and have convinced yourself that you're not a dancer, maybe you could learn a new dance language. I did. I learned a dance language that was sure to win friends and influence people. And of course, make me very popular with the ladies. You all know what style of dancing I'm talking about? Disco. That's right, in middle school, I learned to disco and would disco through the halls of my classroom. And I danced like this. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that did not help me with the social problem of dancing. In fact, I got mocked and mocked even harder than before for my dancing. People continued to tell me to stop, but I kept dancing because I love to dance. And what's interesting is it didn't matter what people said, because as long as I kept dancing, I was on a dancer high. I enjoyed myself. I had a, a self-confidence that came obviously out of nowhere, but I had joy. And it helps actually even reduce anxiety. They did a study for three months having four groups. One learned to dance, one did physical exercise, one music therapy, and the last math. Now, clearly math was not going to reduce anxiety. I could have told them that from the beginning. But the only one that actually helped people reduce anxiety to a significant margin was dancing. See, there's something about dancing that's more than just the sum of its parts. There's something about dancing when we release and move our body to music that it helps us to express ourselves in a unique way. And what's interesting to me about the study is it doesn't matter if you're good or not. You still get the benefits. But thankfully, my dancing did not end with disco. Eventually, I was introduced to Michael Jackson. Not personally, that could have been another issue. I was introduced to his dancing. And I learned the same way that people learn when they're learning a language, by mirroring. And I started to dance, well, a little more like this. All of a sudden, things changed. Now people were asking me to dance. People were inviting me to TED Talks and things, <laughs> saying, you should dance. This is so good that you're so great. And I was introduced to a new world. And the world that I was introduced to was the world of breakdancing. What was interesting about breakdancing is it allowed for a lot of self-expression, but also it was something that was very, very rooted in a culture of struggle, where an inner city culture that I had nothing to do with, I was a suburb kid, I was a foreigner in this world, but they embraced me and they taught me their stories through dance. And it was interesting because I would often get invited to inner circles where I was the, the strangest addition. As this Christian culture kid, that eventually a pastor and brought into these really important conversations where walls came down through just learning to dance. In fact, one time, breakdancing 
actually saved my life. Because for a while, I was a security guard in downtown Detroit. And I was at one of the most dangerous properties there, where there was a drug dealer who had his gang outside. They would listen to hip hop. They would sell drugs in the open, by the way. And I needed to be the security guard. But oddly enough, the property owner didn't care that he was selling drugs. He did care that he stayed up past curfew. This is true. I was supposed to enforce curfew on this guy. I found out later that the other security guards knew to just like let him do whatever he wanted to do. But I was naive enough to go to a drug dealer in my security guard outfit <laughs> and say to him, essentially, you're up past your bedtime. <laughs> now, I'm changing the language here, but he basically said, do you have a gun? I informed him that I had a radio, but I did not have a gun. And he said, well, I have a gun. So what makes you think you're going to tell me to go inside? Now, I'd been dancing for a long time at this point, so the neurons should have been firing better. But I, I said word for word to him, I'm going to battle you for it. He understandably said, what? And I said, I'm going to break dance battle you for it. You got to picture the security guard outfit, right? I'm going to break dance battle you for what? Are you chicken? That's right. I, I said to a drug dealer who just told me he had a firearm that I was going to break dance battle him and I called him a chicken. Thankfully, his friends egged him on, and they had him dance first. And he danced as someone who understood the language. He danced fine. He danced in rhythm. But he wasn't a dancer. And then it was my turn. And I danced a little bit like this. Pass the people, get past the good man. Interesting, because when I got up from the ground, I had now a new friend. We'll call him Mike the drug dealer. <laughs> Mike looked at me right in the eyes and said, from now on, you are my Caucasian. <laughs> I kid you not. He said, if anyone messes with you at this property, you just tell them I'm Mike's Caucasian. <laughs> well, about a week went by. And this teenager was threatening me, you know, like happens every day that I'm a security guard in downtown Detroit. And I said, hey, man, you don't want to mess with me. And he said, what are you going to do, call the cops? And I'm like, no, I'm going to call Mike because I'm his Caucasian. <laughs> and he's like, no, I don't believe it. I'm like, ask him. He's like, oh, I'll ask him. I'm like, ask him. Oh, I'll ask him. The next day, that young man came literally hat in hand to give me the sweetest apology I've ever heard in my entire life and to promise for better behavior from now on in the future. In fact, I never had another problem at that property at all. Now, I don't know who Mike was. I'm a little scared to find out. But the power of dance really did make an impact. And it does in so many different ways. Now, I know most of you are probably not going to be in a breakdance battle for your life with a drug dealer. But we are in a battle as a culture that is losing its identity. We're in a culture that's becoming more and more polarized, and the language, especially of politics and religion, seems to be harder and harder to speak to people from different perspectives than us. And I know I'm naive. I know I'm a foolish priest that, that's just learned to dance. But I truly think that if we embrace each other's cultures enough to learn not only their histories, but actually their dances and their movements, and maybe we could literally and figuratively move together as a society by dancing a little bit more. 
maybe that would give us a little more of the feeling of being a neighbor and learning how to love our neighbors. And maybe, at the very least, on an individual level, with a society where we're more anxious and depressed than ever before, if we started dancing, we'd feel a little better and have a little more purpose. Maybe whether we danced with disco or even square dancing or break dancing or ballet, whether we danced incredibly aesthetically pleasing or like a ostrich having a seizure, if we danced, well, there's no telling where the rhythm might take us. Thank you for your time. God bless and have a great day.